why don't we start, Brent, if you could just go quickly over updated draft of the bill, and then we come back to the um, issue that's probably the most controversial, that's the um, emergency uh, for the um, involuntary medications and involuntary commitment and the timelines. So if you could just run through the copy of the bill. Um. Sure thing. So um, everybody should have draft 2.4 of S114. Hopefully it was posted to the website this morning. Um, and I was just gonna go through the changes that were made um, to this draft from the draft that you looked at last week. Okay. Most of the differences between the drafts are in yellow highlight. Um, so the first one is in section one. This is that rent escrow hearings portion of the bill. Um, so if this is where, if a plaintiff asks for an emergency hearing, the court can exercise its discretion to hear it. Um, and to the extent that the case is heard an, um, as an emergency, then the section would apply. And it gives, if you recall, it gives the judge discretion whether or not to order the person um, to pay rent into escrow. So that the, the change here from the last version is that it's uh, put into session law and it only applies during that emergency period, um, which is the duration of the time that the governor has declared a state of emergency arising from COVID-19. I've, I've talked to Senator Sorokin and she's fine with having this in our bill. Also heard from Chris Rice, who's okay with it. Uh, he represents landlords in many cases. Okay, um, so I'll move on to the next section. Uh, Dick, if I could just ask, um, in a couple of different things we're doing, we're adopting different um, end dates for the emergency. Yeah. So this one is 30 days after the end. In some of the other legislation, it was 60, and then in some others, it's 120. Um, I can understand how you might have different necessities, but I'm just putting it out there. Should we be leaning toward one uh, date to make it easier? Um, because otherwise I think people yeah. might become confused about what's going on and off. Bryn, any comment on that? Um, so I would, what I'll say is that section one, um, the emergency period here is defined the same way it's defined in the Senate Economic Development Bill, which stays all eviction proceedings until the end of the emergency. And that's how it's defined in that bill. The idea was to um, line it up as closely as possible with what's going on in that bill with, re with respect to landlord tenant hearings. And the other, um, the other sort of timeframes of when the state of emergency ends are based on uh, the proposal from the judiciary. So I think that there are some situations which may require a longer um, period after the end of the state of emergency um, and others which don't. So that I didn't come up with these on my own. They came directly from the proposal. Okay, fair enough. I just wanted to well, have it in point. our minds. I've kind of wondered about it too, and maybe we will um, just pick up on that as we get to those sections. So section two is the execution. Right, so this is the- um, oh, power, power of attorney. Okay. Yeah. This is the powers of attorney section. Um, the following is the deed section. These are sort of the same with respect to powers of attorney and the deeds. There's no changes here. Um, remember this just permits the powers of attorney and deeds to be executed remotely over a secure um, communication link rather than requiring that all parties be physically present. Right. So um, I'll move to section four. I'm on page three now. Yep. <clears throat> um, this is the rule 43. This is the section that permits the defendant to waive um, their physical appearance in the courtroom as long as um, they've had the opportunity to consult with their counsel prior to that waiver. And also their appearance is made by audio or visual transmission um, at the time. So the only change there was to add that requirement that the defendant have the opportunity to consult with their counsel before the waiver. We okay there? I'll move on to section five. Okay, this is the section that suspends um, statutory timeframes for some court proceedings until um, the administrative order 49 is terminated. So if you turn to page five, 
um, subdivision one at the top of the page extends the time frame for certain court proceedings. Um, so in subsection A, um, hearings on application for involuntary treatment, which right now are required to be held within 10 days of application, that's extended to 14 days. And hearings on application for involuntary medication is required to be held um, within seven days of application by statute. And that's extended to 14 days as well. <clears throat> Subsection B, <coughs> conditions of release review um, pursuant to uh, Title 13. This, is, um, this applies to people who have been detained as a result of their inability to meet conditions of release or um, who have been released on orders to return to custody. That's required by statute to be held within 48 hours. Um, and this extends it to seven days following the application. And then the other conditions of release review is required by statute to occur within five um, working days. That applies to everybody who's been released on conditions. Um, and that's been extended here to 14 days. That has nothing to do with the involuntary treatment or medication. No. Nope. B and C don't. No. The reason I raise that is that this morning at the Joint Rules Committee, we were given permission to vote on the rest of the bill, but not on these sections having to do with involuntary medication or involuntary uh, treatment. So we're going to continue to take testimony, but we'll need a separate bill for this section. Okay. Hope that's easy for you. <laughs> yeah, just, section, just section A then, subsection A on the um, end. Yeah, subsection A would be out. Where's the involuntary medication? It's there. Oh, it's oh, yeah, subsection, subsection A would be taken out and be dealt with in a different bill. <coughs> At some point. I mean, it could be Thursday, it could be whenever, next week, whatever, but we're not keeping up on it, but Senator, I think the Senate Rules Committee was concerned that one section of the bill would become controversial and hold it up. So okay. that was their decision. I agree with that decision. Okay. I, I don't disagree with it. I just, yeah, that's what they decided. Mm -hmm. So anyway, if you'd keep going through, so we will deal with that separately this morning and hear testimony from Judge Grierson, Morning Fox, Doug Green, and Jack McCullough. We're all waiting. Okay, sounds good. So B and C, those are just um, the ones we just went through apply to bail review. <clears throat> so those, are the, those, those would be the only um, <clears throat> types of hearings for which the statutory timeframe would be extended then. Okay. The, the map do Matt Valerio or James Pepper have anything on the bail review? I have no objection. The state attorneys have no objections. This would more likely impact the Defender General's office. So, I, I'm sorry, I lost part of what was being said there. The conditions of release pursuant and the should be held within seven days rather than what it, what it currently is. And condition of released review would be held within 14 days following application. Yeah, that's, that's, not, that's not a problem. I mean, you know, you'd obviously like to have it done quicker, but we understand what's going on here. The, the real hope is that these things are going to be resolved at the front end as opposed to by review, so. Well, I noticed a case in Bennington that usually would have resulted in much more than a citation for June ended up, you know, just as a citation in June and not even a criminal um, charge. So there's hundreds and hundreds of those around the state right now. Yeah. Bryn, you want to? Okay, so I'll move on to um, subdivision two, starting on line 12. This is the provision that suspends all the statutory timeframes that would apply for issuing orders to seal or expunge or um, to hold hearings on petitions for sealing or expungement until 120 days after AO 49 is terminated. 
And again, that was a proposal um, from the judiciary to keep that keep that suspension extended until 120 days after the state of emergency. <clears throat> Subdivision three. This is the um, this is would require that those statutory timeframes for preliminary or merits hearings on civil suspensions be suspended, and it also um, prohibits any actual license suspensions until that civil suspension hearing on the merits is held. So no changes to that section either. Thank you. And then the last section is section six, the suspension of statutes of limitations for civil actions. Um, there's just been some wording changes here um, that provides that all of those civil, um, civil action statutes of limitations that would otherwise expire during the state of emergency um, are told until 60 days after the governor terminates uh, the state of emergency by declaration. Mr. Chair? Yes. To go back to what I was saying before, um, so in these two sections, we have one at 120 days, one at 60 days. And I understand that those are proposals from the judiciary, but I, I'm just wondering why we couldn't reach one uniform time frame because otherwise we're we're just creating a profusion of different time limits that people will have to keep checking and rechecking to the extent we could find common ground for them it seems like it would be worth the effort <coughs> judge grierson would you like to respond i think you're muted or something For the record, uh, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, Senator Bruth, I, I think each one of those, uh, I understand they're different deadlines, but they reflect um, the particular uh, subject matter. And for instance, um, the expungement uh, extension for 120 days, reality is when, when this, is over and we're trying to get back uh, to whatever the new normal is, we're going to have a significant backlog in every single docket. And the 120 days in expungement to me is more of a reflection of a prior, we're going to have to set priorities on what gets set early. Um, and it, it's more of a reflection of the priority and I would put expungements and ceilings on a very low priority for staffing. Um, the impact on staffing. But for instance, the, the 60 days on the statute of limitations is a reflection, a, a different issue. And it's one that is not involved with staffing. It's a matter of getting those cases uh, that have been held in abeyance because of statute of limitations uh, to process those. Un the, understood. The, I'm the wondering. Days on, on evictions is really rent escrow orders. I, that's something that we would want to start that process as soon as we can. And so that's why each of those dates reflect a different but priority, perhaps as one. Cor correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the let's say they were all 120 days. It wouldn't change your ability to prioritize. In in other words, um, let's say that the statute of limitations we set at 120 days. What what would be it wouldn't change your ability to prioritize that over expungement. It would just create a uniform line in the same way that the beginning of the emergency had a uniform line. It would, and using, for instance, the statute <clears throat> of limitations as an example, there was a debate uh, among the Supreme Court considering this language, uh, the Vermont Bar Association, and then I believe there was a I think it's predominantly a, a plaintiff's uh, group. And there was a debate between 60 and 120 and the court came down uh, recommending 60 days. And I believe the VBA was consistent with that. So it's, you're not wrong. There are other folks wanted a different number. This is our recommendation and it's obviously a, a decision for the committee to make. Um, but I think in, in many respects, they set, they do, um, reflect a priority from the court's perspective. Okay, and it's not, a, it's not a deal breaker for me, obviously. It's just, I feel as though we're, we're doing a, a sort of first pass at these things and we're setting a number of different dates for the end zone. 
and then we will then do other bills and we will wind up creating a kind of mishmash of, of dates. So it will take someone like Brim to keep us straight all the time on when things are ending or, uh, or not. So I just, I just put it out there, but um, I'm happy to go with the recommendation of, of the courts. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions about the dates? Um, Judge, you have another issue that you, I believe, sent out and sent out to everybody. Yes. Regarding the, uh, uh, the requirement that you uh, declare that the above statement is true. What do you call that? Swearing? It's a declaration or Declar swearing as opposed yeah. to appearing before a notary. Yeah. Um, better, but we're when we talk about execution and swearing here, we're talking about <laughs> notary public end. Um, so there is a statute now, uh, Title IV, I believe it's Section 27, um, relating to electronic filing does away with a need for a notary and substitute the use of a notary for any document that is electric electronically filed and allows for a declaration uh, under oath as to the uh, truth or accuracy of the statement. In what this uh, language that I've proposed, and I believe I've sent it to all of the committee members, uh, would allow that uh, substitution for a <clears throat> sworn declaration to apply in any filing in any docket uh, in the court, with the exception, you'll note, in the language of search warrants or application for non-testimonial identification. That same language is reflected in the current statute as it relates to electronic filing. And uh, this, this is a proposal from the court because we're seeing more and more uh, as this uh, situation develops and evolves that the uh, difficulty in finding uh, notaries and the actual fact of uh, social distancing when you involve a notary. So there's a, there's a number of uh, elements in this request. It also comes from the bill that I think some of you, if not all of you have, uh, many members have seen in, involving uh, evictions and um, foreclosure proceedings and the moratorium or stay on those proceedings. There is this exact language in there, in that bill that relates specifically to uh, evictions or foreclosure proceedings. So what we're asking the committee to consider is adopting this same language and allow it to apply to any filings in court. In, in sum and substance, it would be to allow uh, a sworn declaration as opposed to a notarized document. Okay. Uh, some things never change. I lost my agenda again. <laughs> This piece, although coming in late, is probably one of the most important uh, pieces of, of uh, could be of this bill. Are there any questions from committee members about this section? Everybody okay with adding this? Okay. Okay. Um, then we'll go ahead. So that brings us to the more controversial section, which is uh, section A of section five, oh. which, as I said earlier, will become a separate. Why can't I find it? You, you have uh, Jack McCall and Morning Fox and um, Devin Green on your list on the agenda. Well, uh, Judge Grierson, just briefly, could you, exp you you change the wording to be 14 days from the date and combine the involuntary treatment and application for involuntary medi medication. So maybe you can just introduce the changed version. So I, I believe in the earlier version, and I don't have the earlier version in front of me, it was essentially just uh, <coughs> suspending the, the timelines in place. And um, if, if the committee will remember, and as well as the other witnesses um, involved in this, if the committee doesn't adopt this, we're going to continue to attempt to follow the guidelines that are in existence now. Uh, th this is more of a, a, a reality uh, that we're not able to meet those uh, 
guidelines. Uh, we're trying to, and even if you adopt our, our proposed language, the idea behind the language of 14 days was just to create some uniformity uh, in these proceedings. Many times they're combined for hearing anyway. Um, but even if you were to adopt the 14 day proposal, um, we're gonna to attempt to do these proceedings as, as quickly as we can anyway. It's just a, a recognition that um, for instance, um, we're no longer able to hold hearings in these matters in the Vermont Psychiatric Hospital. In that hospital, we have a separate courtroom that where all of these hearings took place. But as a result of not being able to access that facility, we're now turning to remote hearings. Um, and quite frankly, we're struggling to be able to create those uh, remote hearings to everyone's satisfaction. Um, so it, it's not, um, again, I, if the committee decides as a matter of policy just to leave the guidelines, uh, leave the timelines as they presently exist, we will attempt to uh, meet those guidelines. But much like the, the comments that uh, Mr. Valerio said about the uh, bail review and review of conditions of release, it's just a recognition um, that at the present time, we're struggling to meet that short of a time frame. That, that's, in its simplest terms, that's where the proposal is coming from. Um, Thank you, Judge Chris. Thank you. Uh, Jack McCullough, do you have any comments on this section? Are you? Jack has got a picture, but I don't see it. Maybe uh, Morning Fox, do you have anything? Or for, for the record, uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, uh, Department of Mental Health, uh, just checking in. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so, you no, know, I appreciate uh, Judge Grierson's uh, comments and the spirit behind uh, the change. And Judge Grierson is actually very right um, that uh, um, we are working on uh, trying to do, uh, for lack of a better term, virtual hearings. Uh, and uh, we did the first uh, um, relatively successful uh, hearings uh, this past week at, uh, at VPCH, Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, uh, as well as the retreat with some, some hurdles and some, uh, some bumps in the road, but being a new process similar to this testimony new process, um, that's to be expected. And uh, hopefully we're going to continue on that and making it uh, a smoother process. Uh, just like to state from the department's perspective um, that um, hospitals and healthcare workers are already under a tremendous amount of stress right now uh, with the public health emergency that we're doing. Uh, hospital staff are being asked uh, to, to work overtime hours, uh, to work in uh, very uh, uh, potentially hazardous uh, situations that uh, may be hazardous for other reasons normally, but now have an added uh, complexity uh, related to the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic, uh, but the fact that uh, individuals can uh, carry this, this disease with them and not be showing symptoms, the fact that anyone with this could be uh, being served in any facility, uh, and that we're asking healthcare facilities uh, to uh, make sacrifices during this, this time, uh, we, we are asking that the courts and, and everyone else uh, try to work with us as best as possible uh, to meet those needs of the, the statutory timelines. Uh, when we're talking about uh, staff already working extra hours, many staff being out because of illnesses or related to the COVID virus, uh, any delays in our ability to uh, treat people uh, is uh, places our staff as well as the other uh, patients uh, at higher risk for uh, dangerous outcomes. Uh, any delays also, uh, it's pretty well accepted that uh, people are best served as far as from the healthcare epidemic that we're, we're currently dealing with, are best served uh, not in a hospital uh, congregate uh, type setting, uh, as that's where the disease can really spread very quickly. Uh, and so any, any tool that we have to try to help uh, engage someone and get them into treatment and out of the hospital sooner is better. And so we just want to express our concern of the, the potential of the, the delay in uh, particularly applications for uh, involuntary medications uh, could have uh, serious detrimental effects. And uh, it's our hope that we, we keep 
we try to keep on task to uh, meeting those statutory guidelines as is. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Uh, Jack's having a hard time. I can't hear him. He sent a chat. Peggy, are you there? Oh, well. Um, and I don't, Peggy, if you could uh, see if you can get Jack so we can hear from him. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I, I forgot to unmute myself. Yeah, I'm chatting with him right now, telling him to call in because there seems to be a problem on the Zoom with him. Okay. So hopefully he'll call in. All right. Well, we'll jump to uh, Devin Green then um, from the Vermont Hospital Association. Thank you, Devin Green from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. I just wanted to uh, underscore what uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox was saying about mental health patients in our hospitals. We are very worried about them being in the hospitals, so we don't want to see any delay in particular with um, the application for involuntary medication. We want to make sure that we can treat these people as soon as possible and release them as soon as possible instead of keeping them in hospitals longer because any time they're in hospitals longer, they are interacting with other people. Most likely they could be um, exposed, they're interacting with healthcare workers, they could be exposed to the virus and it can spread very quickly. So. Um, we would like to ensure that these cases are prioritized and that there is not delay, although I do understand the reality that the court system is going through. Okay. Is Jack available now? I think are, are there any questions for Devin? I'm sorry. Devin, thank you. Let me see if this is him. Hold on. Hello, Jack. Is that you? 851? Hello, Jack, is that you? We yes, can you hear me? me? Yes. Yeah, is that yes. Jack McCullough? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Thank you. I can, uh, this, I'm Jack McCullough. I'm the director of the Mental Health Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid. Um, as uh, Morning Fox mentioned, we have uh, done a number of these cases. To, to give you an overview, the, the Statute does have some time uh, limits where uh, hearings are required to take place. The typical time limit, except for involuntary medication cases, is 10 days for involuntary medication cases. It's seven days. The courts satisfy the 10-day requirement of ordinary cases by generally scheduling a status conference in those cases within the first 10 days and issuing a scheduling order that uh, calls for uh, disclosure of information and motions and that kind of thing and typically gets the uh, case scheduled uh, for to go to merits within roughly 30 days. The uh, time limits for um, and, and the majority of cases are resolved without uh, having to go to hearing. The time limit for involuntary medication cases is seven days from filing. In, uh, in the recent weeks, we've uh, worked with all the uh, courts to uh, be able to do these uh, <coughs> hearings remotely. And uh, last week we did two trials at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital remotely. In one of those cases, the, uh, the judge and the two lawyers were in the uh, Washington uh, Superior Court courtroom and all the witnesses participated remotely. Um, in the other of those cases, everybody, including the two lawyers, were participating remotely. Um, I did a trial in uh, Wyndham Family Division last Friday and the judge and the two lawyers were physically present in the courtroom. Everybody else was participating remotely. And uh, although there were some technical problems, we finally did get started and we got the hearing going. What we've found is that it's predictable that those hearings are going to take a bit longer than a normal hearing because of uh, navigating the technology. So we may not be able to get as many 
hearings done on a typical court day than uh, than we would have if everything was uh, being done in person. We are fine with uh, with the extension of uh, of the timeline to 14 days. Um, we do have a bit of a concern that uh, particularly in the busy courts, there may be, um, if we don't get cases moving, we will be uh, facing a backlog even during the emergency. I think we're, I, I feel pretty confident that that's not likely to be a problem now that things are moving along and that we're, um, we are have found that we're able with the help of the uh, uh, court staff in the uh, in the clerk's offices and the uh, tech support people working for the judiciary. It seems to be working okay. Um, with regard to the timing of the involuntary medication cases, a number of those cases are scheduled in uh, consistent with the uh, expedited hearing provision of the statute for applications for involuntary treatment. And there's a provision that if the uh, application for involuntary treatment has not been scheduled for hearing within 26 days of filing, that the state has the ability to file an application for expedited hearing of the, of the AIT, the application for involuntary treatment, and then file an involuntary medication case so that uh, those two uh, cases can be heard together. And that's what happened in my trial uh, last Friday. We uh, had the AIT and the involuntary medication trial held, heard together and uh, and the judge issued the decision on, on both of those cases, the commitment case first and then the uh, involuntary medication case. What uh, we're trying to do, and I think it's worked really pretty well so far has been to cooperate with the uh, with the judiciary and with the attorneys in the Department of Mental Health to get cases scheduled as they need to be heard uh, and consistent with the uh, the capacity of the courts and the two offices to do those cases. I'll mention that one other um, complicating factor in these cases that I think we're uh, we've been able to surpass or overcome is that uh, because none of the hospitals are allowing outside visitors, we've had to make arrangements for uh, independent psychiatric exams to uh, to be done uh, remotely, and we've got uh, had received contacts from each of the hospitals so that uh, we can get an independent psychiatrist to meet with the client uh, by video connection. So I think it's, we can live with the statute without any changes, assuming that we'll be able to work out with uh, the courts and with the AG's office, any scheduling issues that, uh, that arise. It would also be fine with us to have the, have the uh, uh, bill passed as it uh, now exists. Thank you, Jack. Are there any questions for Jack from committee members? Uh, David, sure, I see you're on. If you would like to comment on this section, you're welcome to. I know the Attorney General handles some of these cases. David? Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, we, we don't have a lot of comment to add to it. I would say only that we, we have no objection. We think that um, certainly we're all working under difficult circumstances to allow for uh, more flexibility in this time. And uh, with respect to these particular timelines, it seems like a, uh, or it's been altered to be a relatively modest extension and reasonable under the circumstances and we have no objection to it. Thank you. Um, Matt or Pepper, any comment? A committee, what, um, are there any questions or is there a motion to remove? I mean, we've already decided to move these 
remove this from the from the bill. Um, but is there an interest in continuing on with Section A and another bill? Senator White. First of all, I think Pepper was trying to say something, so I'll let him say it first, and then I'll make my comment. I'm sorry, Pepper, I shut you up. No problem. Um, so, uh, no, the state's attorneys do not object to these um, changes. I think what you're hearing is that even under normal circumstances, uh, these timelines aren't always um, abided by through agreement of the parties. So um, you know, I think this change is just a reflection of um, what the court needs to do at this time. So with the state's attorneys do not object. And just to be clear, we do not have jurisdiction over the involuntary medication. So i uh, probably limit my uh, comments just to the involuntary. Okay. Committee, uh, Senator White. So I, I think that um, everybody seems to be okay with extending it to the 14 days, but I do believe that it would cause a lot of um, controversy and that everybody in the Senate is not going to have the ability to hear what we've heard from everybody. And I would recommend leaving it at the seven days. And if we need to come back to it at some point, since we're trying really hard to meet the seven days and we'd tr be trying really hard to meet the 14 days, but I would suggest not having, not making the change because I, I believe it'll cause a lot of controversy in the Senate and may not pass. Well, the other, and I know that um, Senator Lyons wants to look at the mm -hmm. proposal. So I guess we could punt it over there um, temporarily. If, Bryn, if you could just send that over to um, Health and Welfare, ask them for their opinion on it, then we'll come back to it. Is that okay with everybody? Yep. For the rest of the bill, assuming you took out A in um, in section five, taking out A and adding in a new section regarding swearing um, of documents, not swearing at people. Um, is that rest or any questions or comments on the rest of the bill, which would be S114 to present to the full Senate? I'm okay with it, Alice. Okay. So I'm All right. So I think what we have to do is have a roll call. And Peggy, if you could take the roll. Because I'm understanding our new procedures. If I'm correct, Joe? That is true. So I need to find Peggy, or I can guess I could do it. Peggy. Yeah, I'm <laughs> oh, here. I'm sorry. Is. I'm here. Oh, thank I forgot you, to Peggy. Mute my, I forgot to mute myself. Oh, uh, could you call the roll, please? Sure. Hopefully I have it in the right order. Senator Baruth? Yes. Senator White? Yes. Senator Benning? Yes. Senator Nika? Yes. Senator Sears? Yes. Great. Thank you. Oh, um, so Bryn, what we'd do is, is um, you can make a, a final copy and I guess tomorrow I, I could hand it to a uh, speaker, a speaker, Secretary Bloomer, or you can send it to him electronically or I don't know how we're doing it in the new age. Um, we you and um, Secretary Bloomer and, and he can let us know where to go from there. Yeah. And also, would you send a copy to Representative Grad? I think she's going to take it up tomorrow in her committee. Yep, I will. I think they're taking it up on Thursday, and I'll make sure she has on Thursday. Okay. Dick, um, procedurally, procedurally, Dick, I believe you have to sign a copy of the bill, and you have to submit it to the secretary for it to become official. That's what I've been told for the bill we're introducing in institutions. I'll. I'll I'm not great at these electronic signatures, but um, we'll give it a try. I think you could always take a picture of it. You could sign it and maybe take a picture of it and send it to them. Okay. Well, that's a good idea. That's a possibility. I if can, I, I actually have the ability to scan things. Oh yeah. That, that's, that's an option. That'll do it. 
Um, so Bryn, we're gonna wait for the clean copy from you, right? From drafting. That's right. It will oh. um it'll come straight from me later today. Okay, and I'll make sure you have it center Sears. Or Bryn, do you want to just send it to him too? Yep, I'll do that. Okay. Great. Terry, I'm sorry I didn't ask you for any comment from the bar, but uh, oh. Oh, that's fine. I would have had nothing to add to what Judge Gerson indicated regarding the ones I was involved in. Well, but thank you. <laughs> thank you all for the hard work on this bill. We have, um, as I said earlier, uh, we're hopefully going to hear from uh, the Department of Corrections tomorrow. Um, I, I mean, excuse me, Thursday, Thursday um, regarding the update from them on what's going on. Good morning, Fox. While we have you here, is there anyone in the new Woodside program? No, there's not. Uh, we're still working on uh, just trying to stand that up. Uh, our biggest hurdle uh, is going to be staffing. Uh, we we uh, are close to having the uh, number of staff from a psychiatric perspective uh, to be able to maybe open it up. Uh, we're getting close to that. However, we also need medical staff there because it's designed you know, the concept is that it will be for people who actually have COVID-19 uh, uh, and we know that that can, people's uh, conditions can, can change fairly quickly uh, with that. And so individuals who would go there would, would have only mild symptoms. However, knowing that that can change fairly quickly, we have a need to make sure that we have uh, medically trained staff there as well as uh, psychiatrically trained. Uh, and so it's a matter of trying to find all those resources. Um, uh, we're also trying to do some physical structure uh, changes, uh, trying to change uh, from a rehabilitative uh, uh, setting to a uh, hospital uh, setting uh, as well. So uh, still our goal to do that, but we're probably still a good uh, week and a half to over two weeks out before we think we can actually open the doors uh, and take individuals. Thank you for that update. That's helpful. Yeah. Senator White. So perhaps I shouldn't even bring this up, but there is some um, tension here with the Department of Mental Health and the retreat around this. The retreat is um, working with Brattleboro Memorial Hospital to take one of their units and turn it into a 12 bed, um, exactly what Woodside is designed for, which is for people who continue to need mental health care, but have symptoms or have been positive but aren't sick enough to go to BMH. And they are working very hard with BMH to do that. And um, we've been told that the Department of Mental Health is very unhappy with them for doing that because they want to um, have it all at Woodside. So I just... We're, we're, we are not... Uh, unhappy with the retreat and trying to do that. Um, the, we've had a number of conversations with the retreat as well as Brat Memorial Hospital and we have a joint conversation set up uh, tomorrow uh, to discuss uh, some of the plannings around that. Um, Briarboro has gone forward uh, um, to set up that that unit and I, I, we the department applaud them for taking that initiative. Um, uh, if there's any been any displeasure, uh, if you will, uh, <coughs> and in the description of where those patients may come from, um, that uh, it's not necessarily a statewide resource. Uh, Woodside, the perspective of Woodside is, if uh, you're in Springfield or you're in Brattleboro or you're in Bennington or you're in Burlington, you could go to Woodside. Uh, however, with the, the uh, at least as far as my current understanding, with the collaboration between Brat Memorial Hospital and Bradbury Retreat, their concern is that people come from all over the state to that unit. And if they are, are in need of medical services, that it would quickly overwhelm Brad Memorial Hospital. Uh, and so that's, that's the concern uh, that's been expressed in that. So that's some of the discussion. Uh, and so I think that would be some of the difference between what the retreat is setting up and what uh, we're proposing with Woodside is that Woodside, uh, we would see that more as a uh, like I said, a statewide resource, uh, whereas the Brattleboro Retreat, they're looking at it more for the folks who uh, are already within their care that may develop this, uh, or someone from kind of the local area uh, that would come in. But again, it was the major concerns of Brat Memorial Hospital as they're doing the, the medical support for that unit, 
that if someone were to uh, need to be stepped up to hospital medical level of care, uh, that uh, if, if we use that as a unit for uh, individuals with psychiatric needs that have COVID, uh, uh, that, are, that test as COVID positive from all over the state, that it potentially could quickly overwhelm Brad Memorial Hospital. And so that's been, that was, that was the discussion point. It's not that we're displeased or don't want them to do that. Thank you. And I want to just, thanks for bringing it up, Senator White. Thanks for being here, all of you. Um, there are so many rumors floating around as a result of all this, so it's always helpful to be able to deal with it. Actually, on Thursday, one of the issues we're going to touch on, and I know that for Senator um, White, Senator Nicker, and myself, because our districts are right on the border, and Senator Benning, of another state, there's a lot of concern about the border crossings and what does it all mean. So we're going to try to hear from both the Attorney General's office on the enforcement and and AOT on you know the trucks. What what information are they taking? I'm getting people from Hoosick Falls saying, well, does this mean I can't shop in Bennington at the grocery store? Because you know that's where they always go to Hannaford's a price chopper. So there's a lot of confusion. I, hopefully we can settle some of these things in these meetings and uh, try to lessen that. I'm going to suggest we take a four or five minute break. Judge Grissom, go I, ahead. I just wanted to thank the chair and the committee members and uh, particularly Bryn for all the work she did on this bill and uh, also thank the witnesses for understanding uh, where the uh, the basis for the court's proposal that we're just, it's more, this bill is more of a recognition of what we're seeing in the system as opposed to um, any other, any other reason for bringing this bill forward. So I just wanted to thank everyone. So when we get back together in about three or four minutes, Ken Schatz and Christine Johnson are here from DCF and you have received, I think, an email from DCF with Finda, your last name escapes me, um, which is should has four documents that Ken and uh, Christine are going to be going over. So if we could take a break for three or four minutes. Could I ask a question? Yep. What, what's the best way to take a break? I never let my committee do it. It's just I think to... you just put yourself on mute. Just okay. mute yourself and um, go get your coffee, water, or Use the but facilities. We, but we don't leave the meeting. We don't. Oh, don't, don't, leave, don't leave the meeting. No, no, okay. no, no. No, just put yourself on mute. I'm okay. going to, I can mute everybody. And you might want to shut your video off if you're going to get up and go and do something else. So if everybody shuts their video off and then you can put it back on when you come back and I'll mute everybody. And okay, you thank you. When you get back. So for the record, we're taking a break. This is more of an update of where we're at with Woodside, Substitute Care, and the COVID. You've moved twice. Um. That's right. <laughs> so we'll be glad to provide you with that update. Um, Ken Schatz, Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. Christine Johnson, the Deputy Commissioner for Family Services Division, is here with us today. We did provide you some written material to... Um, give you some uh, more detailed information. But again, in terms of uh, responding to Senator Sears to your question, yes, we have um, moved again. We moved into the Middlesex facility yesterday. There are two youth there. One is a, a youth in DOC custody. One is a youth in DCF custody. As you know from our prior discussions with the committee, we were uh, prompted to move from Woodside because of the need of the Department of Mental Health for an alternative psychiatric facility for COVID-19 positive patients. Um, this is all temporary moves to deal with um, this pandemic, but we actually are appreciative of the fact that when the Department of Mental Health vacated the Middlesex site, which only happened last week on Tuesday, that it really did present a better opportunity for us in terms of an alternative to Woodside. It is, uh, frankly, a better facility than Woodside. It is um, hard secure, meaning locked doors, has an outside recreation area with a perimeter fence. It has uh, capacity for five youth 
which is, uh, in our view, the right number for our present needs. So all of that is, is working uh, reasonably well. We did provide you, that is the committee, with a copy of the press release and a more specific stakeholder mem memo that we sent out uh, to describe the program. Essentially, um, the, the idea would be this would be for males. To be clear, we, we have alternative programs available for females. We felt that it made sense to separate out the population because it is a locked facility. It will only be available for youth involved in the delinquency system or in the custody of the Department of Corrections. Um, so not CHINS kids because CHINS kids can't be in a locked facility to be specific. Um, so we, we are, are appreciative of the fact that our staff have uh, had to make two moves relatively quickly. Frankly, I'm greatly appreciative of their flexibility, their willingness to make this move. As far as I know, it went uh, seamlessly. Appreciate the Department of Mental Health and BGS, frankly, also for helping us to make all this happen. So uh, let me uh, first turn to Christine to see if you have anything to add with respect to that move. Christine Johnson, Deputy Commissioner for DCF FSD. Um, no, Ken, I don't think I have anything else to add other than I just wanna emphasize what you've said, which is that our staff have just done an amazing job of pivoting twice. Um, first to allow for adult psychiatric patients who may be COVID positive to have access to the Woodside facility. Um, we, we really, uh, it was, it was a, a huge um, lift and we've done it twice and we've done it successfully. So just very grateful to them. Um, can I, this is difficult to put in the proper term, but Woodside was proposed to be closed in the 2020 budget. Um, now we've moved from Woodside to Middlesex, you actually are saying this is a more ideal spot. Um, does that change thinking or, or at all, or are you re-examining that? In and of itself, it doesn't change our thinking. The Department of Mental Health has been very clear that their intent is to move back into the Middlesex facility once the, the crisis is over. So it's not as if that is available um, in the future, as far as we know. Uh, so for the time being, again, the budget situation to be very straightforward is incredibly up in the air. But as far as uh, we're concerned at this point, we have not made a change in plans. Okay. So this is temporary. Yes. For the duration of the uh, emergency. Exactly. Thank you. Where are the females going to go? We actually have capacity in Southern Vermont through the Vermont School for Girls. Uh, and if uh, Christine can talk more specifically if you're looking for that, but we did uh, enhance their capacity by adding four beds for acute care needs of girls. And they, that is um, definitely a resource. In addition, we, as you may recall, we created two beds in Washington County Mental Health for youth with significant mental health issues who need a lot of supervision. And so that is also needed. Is that at the uh, regular campus uh, on Fairview Street at the Bennington School for Girls? I'll turn to Christine to help answer that question. Yes, that's my understanding. We have four beds that, as Ken mentioned, are for high acuity, and we have 17 beds that are available for general population for females, so 21 okay. total. Okay, because they have group homes throughout the area, and um, as well as the Fairview Street facility, so I, I make a question for some of my constituents. That's Understood. So that has been in operation for several months now. It's not... Okay. Brand new. All right. Thank you. Other questions about the, we're still calling it Woodside, but maybe we should call it the short term residential. 
So actually, and uh, one of the things we did talk a little bit about the name, and one of the things that that uh, we're doing is looking to the residents and staff to think and talk about uh, naming the temporary facility. So if we come up with something, we'll be glad to uh, let you know. I can give you a little history there. Um, we were so original at 204 Depot Street <laughs> that we named it 204 Depot Street. Then we named it 206 Depot Street, then 208 Depot Street. And now we have 119 River Street. So that's the original way to do it. Um, <laughs> well, frankly, long. that's how we came up with Suite 12. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow. Uh, you, that. So, so I thought it sounded like you were also interested in knowing what was going on in our uh, substitute care system. Yeah, and so, how we're dealing with uh, those programs. And in terms of the... Uh, the, uh, the entire system that DCF deals with in state, how they're being dealt with um, under the PNMI rules, right. as well as um, if there are extraordinary, for example, um, I just saw yesterday that VSEA and the administration had come to an agreement on pay. So uh, basically, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, short-term residential program yet to be named with state employees will be receiving a dollar fifty hourly pay increase and if some of those other programs how are they going to deal with that there under PNMI? so you had a list of all of them that i think about 20 programs um, right so, in your so you're correct about state employees and we did actually have within the agency discussion about how to support the existing residential programs, which are primarily run by uh, nonprofits, some DA, some other organizations. We recognize in terms of COVID-19, they are also um, very challenged to maintain ongoing operations. And so we did attach a letter that came from DIVA with respect to the PNMI rate system, the PNMI standing for private non-medical institution, as many of you may be aware, that's the rate setting system that we use for our residential system of care. In effect, what that letter describes is that we will stabilize funding for those programs based on their um, more stable annual costs. So that rather than, and you'll, we'll talk in a minute about how their, uh, their numbers are down right now, we will continue to provide them financial support at their stable rates. In addition, we will make available to them an expedited financial relief, extraordinary financial relief system, so that if they are having uh, to undergo special costs with respect to dealing with COVID-19, we will have a system and a capacity to support them. From our perspective, again, what we need to do is make sure that we're meeting um, the needs of youth who need residential programs right now, but also wanting to make sure that we maintain a stable residential system of care once we come out of this crisis. So we're trying to hold both in terms of short-term needs and long-term needs at the same time. As you can imagine, many people who work in these programs are not exactly high paid jobs. And so they're seeing people who are laid off um, receiving an extra, you know, their unemployment plus an extra $600 and saying, here I am going to work in very difficult situations. Um, we're definitely aware of that. We're aware that um, we need to provide some sort of incentive for staff to work. And that's, as you pointed out, with respect to the state has done that. We fully expect um, these private nonprofits will want to do the same thing. And, and candidly, we want to support them. Right. At the same time, we're seeing reductions in staff. Go ahead, Senator Sears. Sorry, you had a question. Uh, Senator White had a question. Okay. No, I'll let you finish that first because it's about this sheet that you sent out. Okay. Oh, uh, let me, you know, I, I appreciate that, Ken, because that's really a, a I, you know, obviously have um, people who work in that, those programs. I um, am well, well familiar with some of them and right. many of them are concerned about that, but they also have a lot of people out because they're, you know, they have 
child care issues or they have other staffing issues in these programs. So um, that's exactly right. I haven't heard of anybody. You know, I have um, all of the designated agencies, group homes, as well as the Bennington School for Girls um, with a pretty large operation in Bennington, as well as all the Depot Street, River Street programs. So I have a lot of constituents who work in those programs. We do understand that. That's why we provided this chart so you can see the, uh, in effect, the reduction in capacity. And that, again, is a fact of life in dealing with this pandemic. And as you pointed out, you have some staff who have child care issues. You have some staff who are starting to show symptoms. Um, we, the good news, to be very clear, we don't have any children in DCF custody who've been identified as COVID-19 positive. Um, obviously, we're um, expecting that to happen um, because it's happening in other places, to be sure. Uh, we do have the site at Goddard as an available site in case we do have youth who are COVID-19 positive. For the time being, that hasn't happened. But in terms of our residential capacity, it has substantially been reduced. Um, we have uh, recognized that. We are uh, trying to make sure that we meet the needs of youth. We're trying to recognize that we need to be uh, flexible on an ongoing basis to make sure that um, when youth need this level of care that we have it available. It's gonna be an ongoing challenge though, uh, depending on how the, uh, pandemic uh, expands in Vermont, we will keep careful watch on our capacity and the program's abilities to care for kids. Out-of-state programs are basically um, uh, not taking any new referrals. Frankly, most of our in-state programs are not taking any new referrals at this point. So we're trying to manage um, uh, our programs with that in mind. The Numbers, uh, you know, basically we've um, reduced, we were over a hundred, we're about 104 youth were in residential care. Um, we're down to approximately uh, 80 in in-state programs, giving you a sense of the changes that have occurred over the last uh, few couple of weeks. Can the Laraway close just for the interim or is this closed permanently? My understanding is this is temporary. This is related to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We're certainly in conversations with them though on an ongoing basis. So looking forward to them being able to start back up. Senator White. So my question was about the, the list here. I, when I'm looking at it, I see that Woods, the normal capacity was listed as 30 for Woodside, but we know that there weren't 30 people there, even though the capacity was for 30. Were all of these others that are listed at normal capacity, were they all full before this happened and they've been reduced to that or were, is it the same? Wood Woodside, for example, says 30, but we know there weren't 30 right. people there. So the Woodside all number the was, others- The Woodside number is way out of whack, as you correctly indicate. The others are typically not um, always full. It varies. It, it's, um, certain programs, frankly, are more full than others. Um, and so, but we're typically pretty close uh, to three quarters to 95% uh, full in most of these programs. Okay. Again, it does vary over time. Thank you. Yep. Ken, um, our, we had an issue that was raised by Senator McCormick. Uh, at our joint meeting regarding visitation um, by parents. And my understanding is in all of these programs, the visitations are done remotely like we are today. Is that correct? No? I'm not aware of that. I think we deal with visitation. And as you know, we did ask the Supreme Court um, to uh, suspend in-person parent-child visitation. The court refused, didn't deny that request. So. Every case has its own visitation order by the court. And so we are doing our best 
to, um, frankly, encourage all families, whether they're in residential programs or in foster care, to use remote visitation there are, uh, for the, by and large, most families have agreed to that. There are a few exceptions. We don't have a special rule for residential programs. Okay. And so we are operating on a case by case basis at this time. Thank you. I, um, I know we heard a lot from foster parents, which is part of the substitute care system, obviously, who are concer were concerned about the visitation by parents. And, um, That's absolutely and, right. That's an ongoing concern and candidly an ongoing challenge for us. Are you losing foster parents as a result? Or? You know, we've been told we will. I don't know that anybody has um, actually refused care of a child for that reason as we sit here today. Maybe Christine has more up-to-date information than me, but I know that that's a real risk that we're looking at. That's my understanding as well as we're hearing from our field offices that um, it's becoming a real pressure. Um, but to date, I don't know of anyone who has stepped down um, as of yet. Anybody with other questions about that? Issue? Um, I know that um, Senator McCormick has a, an amendment that uh, has been drafted by Michelle Childs to uh, not only for foster care, but for uh, not only for substitute care, but for kids that are in the uh, um, uh, what's the right word um, in the civil courts with uh, standards, um, you know, parental contact issues. So, um. so if there are further questions about that, I'll turn it over to Christine to talk more about what's going on. Um, with respect to our foster care system. Yeah. Sure, okay. So I just wanted to let you all know that we have um, done a stipend for all foster parents who currently have kids in their care. Um, for the month of March, um, every foster parent will receive an increase of $20 a day across the board. Wow. And that will go out in this week's a payment to foster parents. We will evaluate at the end of April. I'm guessing we will likely do this again uh, for the month of April. Um, and it's really our way of, of acknowledging the extra burden that our foster parents are carrying given you know, the situation with childcare and schools being closed. Um, and we're also looking to do an increased rate of $75 a day if foster parents are caring for a child that is COVID positive. And so we're hoping to incentivize, um, you know, our, our real goal is for our residential programs and our foster parents to be willing to keep the kids in their care and really uh, maintain a shelter in place, if you will, even if they have somebody that is COVID positive. And as Ken mentioned, the Goddard site will allow us to have the capacity in a very planful, thoughtful way in case somebody cannot be maintained in a foster home or in a residential placement. Um, but our first line of defense really is to make sure that our kids are served in the families that they're with now or in the residential program that they're, that they're in now. So those are some of the things that we've been putting in place to, to help bolster the system. Great. Questions, comments? It's good. Yes, yep. I, I do wanna ask a question with sure. Christine. So Christine, I'm just wondering when you say the, um, the foster family will get $20 per day across the board or 75 if caring for a COVID child, but is that just one payment for the month or is that per child? You, oh, you said per week. No, it's actually $20 per child per day. So <laughs> that's right. And 75 per day per child if COVID positive. Yes. Okay, thank you. Other questions, comments on any of the reports from Ken? And um, do you actually have numbers of kids or any kids who are COVID positive that are in in either group homes or substitute care? I think you mentioned none, but in foster care. That's right. To date, we have none, and, and we're really incredibly fortunate for that. Yeah. All right. 
Well, we're going to make your 1130. Um, I guess there are no other questions. Right, thanks thank so you. much for the update. And thanks. I, I really appreciate you working with PNMI and, and uh, dealing with these um, group homes. Um, You're welcome. Thank you. As a former operator myself, I completely understand what, what those folks are going through. Um, we never went through anything like this, luckily, uh, when I was working there. And, uh, so, it's yeah. strange. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah. It is an incredible challenge for everyone involved, as I know you all understand. So we yeah. appreciate everybody's uh, efforts and commitment. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Well, we're going to turn to the final item on the agenda, which is the... Um, an issue that um, regarding the sentence modification. And I just wanted to make clear because I've had some comments on social media and other places that um, about this. And I think clearly it's an issue that needs to be dealt with in the normal cost course of events when we can have witnesses from the Defender General, the state's attorneys, the victims groups, and any other groups that are involved, um, rather than as part of an emergency situation. And I know that um, what is concerning to me is that this would have been permanent and we wanted to make it temporary. And I think, and I made the suggestion that we limit groups, and I think Matt was correct in suggesting that we just leave it alone at this point. So I, um, I, that's why I, I haven't done that, and I asked, and we didn't post S217, but I have to tell you that when 217 got early posted or something about it on our agenda, um, I started to get these emails from groups who are against the bill that deals with sex workers that came over from the house. They wanted to testify. Um, so we have to be extremely careful when we post stuff about different bills because they thought that we were taking up that bill and we're trying to push it through without testimony. Um, we're certainly not going to do that. I assure everybody that we're not taking up bills without getting full testimony on them that uh, other than these emergency situations. And I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. And I know Matt's still on board and Pepper's still here and, or, and David Scher and Judge Grierson, anybody who wants to speak on this issue um, before we end the meeting. Judge Grierson. Request was not intended to be permanent. Like everything else in the bill, it was temporary and as I said there's nothing about that request um, that the court took a position on again it was a reflection of what um, some of what we were hearing in the um, in the process so uh, I certainly understand the committee's position and uh, that was not our intention other than to let the committees know this is one of the issues we had been seeing out there it was not intended to uh, take any of authority away from. Uh, I would say it would, one of the things that we're trying to do is stay away from um, issues that, at least from my point of view, to require more testimony and more people. To, no, I understand. Anybody else who would like to comment? As long as you're not taking it up, I'm fine. Okay. We. Uh, did we are. I'm just as happy to see it um, deferred because I support the intentions behind it, but I, I do have a lot of questions about it and it seems like the sort of thing we would need a couple of months to work out. I agree. Pepper, did you have a I'm just on the same page as the committee. I think we'd like um, a full opportunity to kind of talk about the process and the procedure and how we could work through a, a, a process that kind of gives victims voices and um, just has a, a lot more guidance from the legislature. Okay. David, did you want to comment? David, I don't really have much further to say. Um, 
you know, our position on it remains the same, but I also understand the committee's uh, need to have a more thorough vetting of this type of legislation, and we respect that and um, appreciate <coughs> that perspective. Well, I've got you right here in front of us. Um, for Thursday's agenda, what we're looking for, or what I'm looking for, and is how exactly the enforcement of the governor's orders would be going um, and be done by the attorney general's office. And what created some confusion for some people was in Vermont Digger, there was a story regarding Burlington and their particular changes. And then the state's um, looking at lodging. And I think um, people were, some people were concerned that we were going to hand people a thousand dollar fine, for example, for um, being five feet away from somebody at a supermarket. Um, so I, I, that's really what the subject is, whether you or the attorney general or whomever wants to speak, we're happy to hear from anyone regarding how we're going to enforce this. And then the other issue is the borders and people coming back and forth. And there's a couple of other issues on there for Thursday, but just so to be clear to what we're, what I think we're looking at is what exactly is going on and how is the attorney general going to enforce it? I don't know if you read the story about Rhode Island, um, but it's a fascinating story that three people, three men from Massachusetts decided to go play golf with their, retire, with their Rhode Island buddy. So they stopped at McDonald's in Rhode Island, got out of the car and um, put their golf clubs in the Rhode Island car and then went off to play golf. And somebody from the McDonald's called and um, said they were from Massachusetts and it's against the law in Rhode Island, I guess, under the governor's order to play golf uh, if you're from out of state. And so they, they each got fined or are facing a court date on a thousand dollar fine for having played golf in Rhode Island. So, that type of thing is happening. People are reading these stories and are wondering what, you know, what it is Vermont is planning. Senator White, do you want to Could go I... to Rhode Island to play golf? No, no, I don't. I don't even want to play golf in Vermont. Thank you. Okay. But you can't. Um, so I would throw in on that question, and I don't know if um, David would be the appropriate person to answer it or not, but. I'm getting a lot, we have um, a number of state parks around here and people are very concerned about um, people coming up for day trips to because we're so close to the border, people coming up to go to the state parks for the day. And what what is the, um, I've gotten a ton of emails from Jamaica area. Maybe we could ask. Jamaica, Vermont. So if we could actually say, is there any enforcement around that also? And how, how is that working? You can check on that for Thursday too, David. Maybe uh, Peggy, if we could add, if he's available, somebody from Forest Parks and Recreation. Uh, sure, anyone have any suggestions? Well, we might start, start, it, it, start it with the commissioner and work our way down. Yeah, for, uh, Forest and Park Recreation, you said? Yeah, Forest Parks and Recreation is, uh, I can't think of his Mike name. Snyder. Mike Snyder, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. If he can't make it, find to send somebody else. Yep, sounds good. Okay, anybody, any, anything else? So, um, Bryn or would you either Eric, Bryn or Michelle be joining us on Thursday? I think it's going to be me. Okay. I'll be there. <clears throat> so you will send me electronically the bill we voted out, and I'll have to sign it electronically and send it to John Bloomer? Yes, I'm going to plan to send it to you and to Secretary Bloomer, and he can give you specific instructions about whether you need to sign it and scan it or if you can just take a picture, or maybe even just your email, um, an email saying I approve it will okay. be sufficient. Joe, what did you do for your bill? I've, I've got a, a copy of it from Ledge Council. I'm signing it and I'm bringing it in tomorrow physically. Oh, I guess I could do the same, I guess. 
We we just sent ours to Secretary Bloomer and to Tim Ash, and I haven't heard how we're, if I'm supposed to do anything. Well, maybe we should find out what we should actually do. I can certainly print it off. I can sign it, scan it, and sign it. You know, can I? Sign can, I can I ask that uh, Peggy send us all a link to Thursday's uh, meeting? Yep. Uh, yes. Yep. I definitely will do that. Um, and I had reached out to Senator Bloomer myself, to, uh, uh, not Senator Bloomer, Secretary Bloomer, to ask what the process was, and I never heard back. So hopefully, um, you guys will get that information, one of you. All right. So busy. Hey. Well, um, thank you all very much, and we'll see you all Thursday, if not tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. You might not get the link till till tomorrow or Thursday tomorrow probably, but just know that you're we're meeting Thursday. Okay. All right. But from Thanks. ten o'clock, ten to twelve. Yep. Thank you. Bye. 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 Now. Bye.